Luke chapter 23. Y'all, y'all should be there by now. Rob, Robert done gave me y'all plenty of time. Luke chapter 23. All right. New Revised Standard Version, verses 18 and 19. Let's see. Then they all shouted out together, away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. Verse 19, this was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. I want to open this series by tagging this text, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> I heard somebody say, buckle up. <laughs> Growing up, um, some of you may not know, my favorite subject in school was history. I've always had a deep interest in knowing how things came to be what they are. The older I've gotten the more I realized that I have a great love and interest to explore the intersection between history and anthropology or the study of cultures, peoples, and ways of life. I've, I've discovered deep intrigue in looking at how cultures have been shaped and how people have been impacted by the events that have taken place in their history. I think the passion I have for justice very likely comes from this intersection. It comes from understanding how historical atrocities like slavery and segregation impact the America we live in today. Studying at the intersection between history and anthropology has caused me to believe wholeheartedly that you can determine a lot about a society based on what they do with their power of choice. All, all people, groups, and cultures don't have broad freedoms to make decisions in the same way as other people, groups, and cultures. But if you watch long enough, a decision will be placed in the hands of people. And you'll learn a lot about what matters to them and the trajectory of their society based on what they choose. We've seen it throughout the course of human history. Consider how the continent of Africa was impacted by the slave trade, which exposed the racism that existed and still exists in the world. The centuries-long evil practice of trying to subjugate those whom God made free reveals the power of greed. I say again, you can determine a lot about a society based on what they do with their power of choice. And to choose this horrific practice revealed what mattered most to people and impacted the trajectory of that society. Because I hold true to that belief, I've always viewed the story found in our text today as one of the most pivotal moments in all of human history. It was this choice in our text, this public vote that reveals something that still impacts the world today. One day, thousands of years ago, a society had a choice and they chose wrong. Luke details it for us. After Jesus is betrayed by Judas, deserted by his disciples, arrested and falsely accused by the religious leaders, and mocked and assaulted by the temple guards throughout the night, early the next morning, Jesus is carried to Pontius Pilate, Rome's political assignee to govern Judah. His job was to keep the peace, ensure taxes were paid, squash out rebellions, and ensure that Rome's power was established in that conquered province. That morning, he was called on to make a judgment concerning capital punishment. The Jewish religious leaders wanted him to execute someone, but they did not have the authority to make that decision themselves, so they brought him to Pilate to make the choice, and the person they wanted to execute was Jesus. 
you, you know Jesus, he who knew no sin. Jesus, the one who turned water into wine, gave sight to the blind. Jesus, the one who forgave the sinner and set the captive free. Jesus, who curated a movement of justice, righteousness, and peace. The religious leaders brought that Jesus to Pontius Pilate to execute him. There was one tiny problem. The problem was Pilate found no fault in Jesus. Pilate found every charge they brought against Jesus frivolous and even declared him not guilty three times. Yet the religious leaders and the crowd that they influenced wouldn't be satisfied by anything but Jesus' execution. Because it was customary for the governor to release a prisoner to them at Passover, Matthew's account says that Pilate gave the people a choice. He could simply chastise Jesus by flogging him and releasing him, or he could release a prisoner he had in custody named Barabbas who has quite a rap sheet. John 18.40 says Barabbas is a robber. Verse 19 of our text today says he is a murderer and insurrectionist. Scholars suggest he may have been a leader of the Jewish zealots who were fighting to overthrow the Roman Empire that was ruling unjustly over them. It is widely believed that Barabbas' criminal activity was rooted in the pursuit of a noble cause, freedom. Barabbas had a just desire and a just motive, but he sought to deal with the state-sanctioned murders of others by becoming a murderer himself. He sought to deal with the system that robbed the people with unjust taxes by robbing others himself. And allow me to pause parenthetically here to offer some important thoughts. I contend and believe wholeheartedly in the pursuit of justice and tearing down unjust systems. You hear it often in my preaching. I believe it is the work that Jesus did and it is the work Jesus calls us to. However, I believe that in our pursuit of justice, we cannot afford to become the thing we despise. Dr. King said, you can't drive hate out with hate. Only love can do that. Barabbas' decisions caused him to be arrested and very likely were about to cost him his life. It is believed by most scholars that Barabbas is soon to be crucified for his crimes as a statement to all rebels of what would happen to them if they decided to mess with Rome. Pilate decided to give these oppressed and conquered people a choice. They could choose between Jesus and Barabbas. The people had a choice. Unconscionably, unbelievably, they cry out, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. When given a choice, they chose the criminal. You can determine a lot about a society based on what they do with their power of choice. Pilate had a choice. He found Jesus not guilty three times and still crucified him. Herod had a choice. He was intrigued by Jesus and according to the text had been desiring to see him to determine what all the hype was about. He found no wrongdoing, but instead of releasing him, he mocked him and sent them back to Pilate. The religious leaders and the crowd that was with them had a choice. They could have chosen to see Jesus for who he was at any point in the last three and a half years during his ministry. They could have chosen to accept Pilate and Herod's not guilty verdicts and go on with their lives. They could have chosen to cast their vote for the candidate more deserving of the reward of freedom. Instead, they were unified in their thirst for injustice and requested that Pilate would give them Barabbas. What a disheartening scene. 
What would make somebody choose Barabbas? There is a reason for the decision. I found great intrigue in what would make people cry out unanimously. They want Barabbas. Close interrogation of the narrative that Luke provides details, the reasons, and the examination of these reasons is necessary to ensure we don't make the same mistake as the crowd in the text when we get the power of choice. It's called this point the reasons for the decision. One reason for the decision is that Pilate was guilty of choosing that which was politically expedient over that which was just. He chose what was politically expedient over that which was just. At the time of our text, the Roman Empire dominated the world. They had conquered much of it and it brought many people groups under their rule. The Roman government believed in what was called Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome. And they sought to achieve it by ensuring their subjects, particularly those who were part of their conquered territories, didn't rebel, paid their unjust taxes, and kept quiet. In order to do that, the Roman emperor, in this case Caesar, placed governors in each of these areas to rule. Many of these governors had higher political aspirations and ambitions They wanted to get promoted in the government and eventually have some power in Rome, not the outpost they were assigned to. So Pilate was appointed to oversee the province of Judah in 25 AD, and it was believed that he had other ambitions. Like many of the governors, he viewed the province he was placed in as beneath him and the people who lived there as beneath him. He felt he was above the place and he felt he was above the people. He didn't like the Jews, and quite frankly, the Jews didn't like him. He didn't understand them because he didn't understand them, and they didn't like each other. He made a lot of political mistakes. Their their religious laws meant nothing to him. He didn't understand the sanctity of their temple. and Even though he tried to manipulate it, he didn't get it. He erected pagan Roman banners in the temple. Matter of fact, Luke 12 reveals that he sent armed Roman spies into the temple during worship to silence protesters. He didn't have a very high approval rating. And and in those days, low approval among the people often led to rebellion. So there are multiple moments in this narrative that he made choices that he thought would bring him political capital instead of doing what was right. Here's the first example. First, when he knew Jesus was innocent, instead of releasing him, he sent him to Herod Antipas. Now this is the Herod that executed John the Baptist. Herod wasn't a Roman official. He was actually a local Jewish leader who was given permission by the Roman government to operate in a political position of power to serve as a buffer between the Jewish people and Rome. He gave leadership in the province of Galilee where Jesus was based. So when Pilate found out that Jesus was from Galilee, he sent him to Herod, who just so happened to be in Jerusalem for Passover. It's important for you to know a couple things about this. Number one, you need to know that Pilate and Herod didn't have a good relationship. They were enemies. They were not politically aligned. Two, you need to know that according to Luke's gospel, Herod wanted to see Jesus. He had been wanting to see Jesus because he was in Galilee and heard about all the stuff that Jesus was doing. He wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle himself. He was interested in Jesus just like he was interested in John the Baptist. Allow me to pause here so that you can know some more history. It was Herod who was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. But before John the Baptist was beheaded, he would bring John the Baptist into the court all the time to hear John the Baptist preach because he was interested in what John had to say. But but did not think it was going to make any impact on his life. There are people that are intrigued by preaching and in pre- intrigued by Jesus and have no desire to change. They just show up for the show. Uh huh. So, Luke reveals that Jesus goes to Herod. Herod comes to the same conclusion as Pilate. Jesus is innocent. But after mocking him by putting a royal robe on him, 
he sends Jesus back to Pilate. Can I just pause here? This ain't even in my notes, but I find it very intriguing that even in jest, Herod affirms who Jesus is. Sends him back to Pilate. Luke 23, 12. Is your Bible open? Yeah. Says that this exchange, is your Bible open? Yeah. Causes them to go from being enemies to friends that day. Pilate saw an opportunity to forge a political ally and an innocent man was a pawn in the game. He chose politics over what was right. Friends, be very leery of those who choose political expedience over doing what's right by people. Buckle up. There's going to be some turbulence in the cabin. Because we see it all the time. We see it in American politics all the time. The American political system is built on this idea. Super PACs with deep pockets fund campaigns so that they can influence legislations that line their pockets and fits their business interests and the innocent pay the price. That's why we can't get gun legislation and we're still seeing kids murdered in schools and gunned down in our communities. But lest y'all think this sermon is about politics, do not get it twisted. It exists in every structure. It exists in the church. It exists in religion. It exists in business. It exists in education. And if some of y'all was going to be real transparent, it exists in your family dynamic. Innocent people are violated for the sake of the comfort and convenience of those in power seeking to solidify their own agendas. And when we decide that individual capital and authority is more important than the lives and the livelihoods of those around us, we'll make the wrong decision just like Pilate did. Whenever you choose based on what you think is best for you, even if you got to step on somebody to get to where you want to get to, you'll always choose wrong. Trying to climb the corporate ladder, no matter how many people you make wrongs, which makes you choose wrong. Yeah. Somebody say amen, please or ouch, or something. Not only was, was the reason rooted in Pilate choosing political expedience, Pilate was guilty of desiring to please people more than he wanted peace. This desire for political expedience influences how Pilate makes people decisions. The text says that there is a unified group who has approached Pilate requesting the execution of Jesus. This group is the group led by the Jewish religious leaders that arrested him in chapter 22, brought false accusations and false, false witnesses against Jesus in a farce of an overnight trial. They spit on Jesus, punched him, in the face repeatedly before bringing him to Pilate as chapter 23 opens. The text uses interesting language when describing this group. Verse 1 in the NRSV says, the assembly rose as a body. Your translation may say something to the effect of the whole company of them or the whole assembly or the whole multitude of them rose. This is speaking to a unity of a particular group. Verse 18 says, this particular group all shouted together so loudly. They all shouted together so much that by the end of verse 23, the Bible says their unified voice prevailed. 
Pilate, in fearing a rebellion or a riot, allowed these people who, according to Luke, were unanimous in their decision to see Jesus executed. Layman's terms. Everybody in the crowd shouted, give us Barabbas. Everybody in the crowd shouted, crucify Jesus. Everybody. 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 Where were the disciples? Where were the people who had been healed by him? Or like Pastor Jeremy reminded us of early, the thousands upon thousands of people who ate off his power. Where were the ones who cried Hosanna a few days ago? Where were Jesus' family members? Chances are they weren't there. I know many preachers, myself included, have often discussed how the crowd goes from pro-Jesus on Palm Sunday to anti-Jesus in this moment. But the thing you need to know is these are two different crowds. In fact, it's actually believed that the crowd on Palm Sunday was much bigger than the crowd at Jesus' public trial. This means that there were a lot of people who never had their voices heard. There were a lot of people who would not have aligned with this mob, but they either didn't show up or they didn't speak up. And allow me to pause again parenthetically to suggest that this is why it's important that you let your voice be heard in local, state, and national elections. Because when you don't use your voice, other people are speaking on your behalf. What would have been different in this narrative if everybody would have showed up? What would happen if the Hosanna, Hosanna folks showed up at Pilate's house for the trial? What, what would happen if the people who saw Jesus move in power showed up to advocate for him? What would happen if you showed up to the school board meeting? What would happen if you showed up to the city council meeting? What would happen if we showed up to the space? Whoa, y'all quiet on me today. What would have been different if people would have spoken up? But beyond that, Pilate makes a mistake that a lot of people pleasers make. He focused on the people in his face in the moment, not the people who would have been impacted by the decision because they weren't present in the moment. This is the danger of pursuing the desired responses of people overdoing what's right and just. What Pilate didn't know is the loud group in his face did not represent the majority. And he made the mistake of trying to appease the people in front of him rather than do what's right and trust that there were more people who would have been with him than people who would have been against him. And before y'all go judging Pilate, I wish I had time to step into your, your work meetings and see how many people you've done it to. How many times you've saved face corporately just to get people off your back and out of your email inbox knowing that somebody else was at stake and you stepped on somebody just to get what you wanted and to get people to leave you alone. How many more students would you have advocated for if you didn't have higher ups in that school telling you to leave them alone and drop them and leave them behind or pass them on to the next grade even though you know they were at a remedial reading level? Well, y'all quiet on me in here. How many times have you sat around the family table and told somebody to keep their trauma quiet because you didn't want it to get out? Because what happens in this house stays in this house. I wish, I wish I had a church praying with me. And listen to what Pilate does. Pilate 
knows what's right, but ignores it for who's present. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but ignored the innocence of Jesus because of those who stormed the gates of his palace. And here's the cost, church. You, if, you, if you read the Bible, you study the story, you know that Sister Pilate had something to say about it. Claudia. Sister Claudia, Claudia. Pilate's wife said, uh, doc, listen, the, I can't sleep. I've been troubled in a dream all night. Leave this man alone. Because when you try to please people, you cost yourself peace. I wish I had a praying church. I wish I had some honest people who can admit and acknowledge that the real reason you can't get no sleep at night ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It has everything to do with the fact that you're spending all your time trying to figure out how you're going to be embraced and accepted by people who will do anything to manipulate the outcome. You stress, you struggling, your hair falling out, your blood pressure going up because you trying to please people. And the reality is the people coming to you ain't doing nothing but trying to manipulate you anyway to get their desired outcome because they don't care about what's right. They care about what's expedient. And here you are in the crosshairs because you refuse to stand up for what's right. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 I'm on y'all nerves on the clock moving. The, the, there, are, there are reasons. There are reasons for the decision that they make. Yes, sir. Political expedients, people pleasing, manipulative religious leaders, yeah. jealousy and envy all at work. But I swear I love this church. I love, woo! I love this church. This is the Antioch way, and I'm here for it. That's what that's right, Mama Judy. Narcissism. Unwillingness to embrace the kingdom agenda that Jesus brought. So many things at work. And because of it, they made the wrong choice. And I need y'all to hear me. I don't care what the reasons for the wrong choice are. There are ramifications to the wrong choice. Now, I'm in a Baptist church. I'm a car-carrying Baptist, so y'all know what happens next. The old preacher would say Jesus got marched from judgment hall to judgment hall. And after being... Declared not guilty, Pilate says, I find no fault in him, but if y'all want to execute him, whatever. He washes his, his hands of him. Do with him what y'all want to do with him. Jesus is led to be beaten beyond recognition. They force him to carry the instrument of his execution to the place of the execution. And Luke records that on the way, this is interesting to me, on the way, there are people who have now woken up They were asleep during the trial. The trial was too early in the morning. The, the trial was too early in the morning. So now that they're awake and they see what's happening, they woke up, saw what was happening. They have lined the streets, showed up to Jesus' flogging, and follow him from the place of the flogging to the place of the crucifixion. And they are wailing and crying with a loud voice. And allow me to pause here and say, that's why you can't afford to wait till it's too late for your voice to be heard. It's our dear sister Zora Neale Hurston that said, if you are silent in your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. They weren't there to speak up during the trial. They're there to cry during the execution. Ooh, I wish I had time. God Almighty. 
to talk about how many people will show up for you at the wrong time to act like they cared, but if they really cared, they would have showed up a scene earlier. Don't show up in my life now that I'm dealing with a consequence I don't deserve. You should have showed up when you knew I needed you to be present. <laughs> at any rate, Lord, this clock is moving. <laughs> you, if you really care, be there all the time. Not just for the miracles, but for the mess. Not not just for the mountaintops, but for the valleys. Don't be there to advocate for me when I can't speak for myself. At the tables, I'm not sitting at what you got to say. All right, I got the move. So, so, so now, now everybody crying. Everybody hollering. Everybody posting. Now, everybody care about justice. Now. Now that y'all don't woke up, but it's too late. And so, as they're wailing, if your Bible's open, verses 28 through 31 says something interesting. As they're wailing, crying, hollering, Jesus says, yo, no, 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 no. Don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. There will come a day, Jesus says, where they'll say, blessed are the barren, those who don't have to have no children in this society. They will prefer for the mountains to fall on them because if this is what they'll do when it's green, what will they do when it's dry? Y'all know what Jesus is really saying? What Jesus is really saying is, if y'all let them do this to me, what do you think they're going to do to you? If y'all let them do this to me who knew no sin, what you going to think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to you when this society gets its hands on you? And it's only going to get worse for your children. It only going to get worse for your children's children because what we select as a society enforces and influences what we got to suffer as a society. All right. Choosing the seed of violence will always bear forth fruit of violence. Don't ask me why America is a violent nation when America has sown seeds of violence against her own citizens and against the citizens of the world, don't be surprised, in the words of Malcolm X, that the chickens come home to root. Ooh, it's quiet on me in here, but I said what I said, and I'll add more to it. What you choose as a society impacts your consequences as a society. Unless y'all think I'm just talking about politics, I'm not. What you've chosen to make art in society. What you've chosen to embrace as media in society. What you watch and what we listen to and what we repost and what we make go viral and what we retweet and what we allow our kids to watch on YouTube has created the society of violence and poverty and suffering because we keep choosing Barabbas. Making, f never mind. Making foolish, hateful felons political leaders and, and making people who don't care about our community superstars and making selfish people pastors and making people who don't care about other people our community activists. At some point, we got to stop choosing Barabbas.
There are ramifications for choosing Barabbas. It, it creates the culture that we live in. And we're ready to blame the emerging generations for the world we created. The world we created for not showing up or speaking up. The world we created for picking and choosing when to care. The world we created by being more concerned with upward mobility than community engagement. The world we created by putting Jesus on the back burner and being focused on our deluxe apartment in the sky. I, I, trying to move on up, moving up so far that we forgot the very foundation that brought us and carried us. So you'll spend three hours in the house lawn and can't come to church for two and trying to figure out why the world is what it is. Matter of fact, some of y'all wish I shut up now because you got brunch plans and football plans and ready to spend the next six hours doing a bunch of nothing. But here's some stuff that can change our world and you wish I'd be quiet. The devil is a bald head, cockeyed, pigeon-toed, slew foot lie. Our communal, cultural decisions have impact that create the world we got to live in. All right, I got to go. There are reasons for the decision. There are ramifications of the decision. But I wouldn't do this text justice if I don't talk about the redemption in the decision. God help me. It is important that we know and discuss the reality that Jesus' death was unjust. It is important to know that the death Jesus died was rooted in injustice. And I know y'all spiritual but we can't have such a spiritual worldview that we miss the societal implication of what's happening here. This is injustice. He was brought to court on trumped up charges. Found innocent by two judges and was still executed. There is no justice in Jesus' death. This is a state-sponsored lynching. And this is why Jesus identifies with the oppressed. Because before there was Emmett Till, there was Jesus. Before there was Medgar Evers, there was Jesus. Before there was Dr. King, there was Jesus. Before there was Malcolm X, there was Jesus. Before there was a Mike Brown, there was Jesus. Before there was Trayvon Martin, there was Jesus. Before there was Sandra Bland, there was Jesus. Before there was another list to another, there was Jesus. Jesus knows what it's like to be the victim of a state-sponsored execution. Jesus knows what it's like to be a victim of an unjust death penalty. And we got people languishing on death row now because of a death penalty penalty that will allow innocent people to be killed and even guilty people who God still got time to change to die prematurely. Oh, I'm in my bag today. This is a state-sponsored lynching. He is publicly executed in the most gruesome fashion known to man and made a spectacle, spectacle of, although he did nothing wrong. Yeah. This injustice is because the people choose wrong when given the choice. And the consequences are still felt. Everybody in this text, not named Jesus, made some wrong choice. Barabbas made wrong choices. He landed him in Rome's crosshairs. Pilate and Herod, political leaders, made wrong choices. 
to ignore doing right by an innocent man in order to be embraced by the crowds in their face at the moment. Individuals, institutions, the religious leaders and the crowd made the choice. There's good news though. There's good news. The bad news is Jesus died because of a choice. That's the bad news. The bad news is Jesus died because of a choice. The good news is Jesus died because of a choice. Because Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I got the power to pick it up again. So Jesus didn't have to go through with it. Jesus chose to. Jesus didn't have to take the cross. Jesus chose to. Jesus didn't have to go through it. But that day, Jesus made a choice. Jesus made a choice for Barabbas. Come here. Barabbas was in prison on his way to a cross because of his own mistakes. Then Jesus showed up. And when Jesus shows up, Barabbas, who should be on his way to his own cross, gets to walk free because Jesus came to set the captive free. All right, all right. I feel like preaching now. If not, y'all will go with me. Is there anybody in the room this morning who can say, I got a testimony like Barabbas? I was sinking. Yes, sir. Deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. I was seeking to rise no more, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Jesus redeemed me, and that was Jesus' choice. Jesus chose to set me free because the sins I committed were of my own making I made some bad decisions I made some bad mistakes but Jesus showed up and chose me and it's Jesus' choice despite my choice that allow those of us who have been like Barabbas to sing a new song that says I've been redeemed bought with the price Jesus has changed my whole life so if anybody asks you just who I am tell them I've been redeemed and he doesn't just redeem our souls and redeem our lives like Barabbas but he'll redeem you from the wrong choices you made just like the crowd that's probably what causes Jesus to say the words he says on that cross that Luke records in verse 34 of this very chapter while his hands are nailed and his feet are nailed and a crown of thorns on on his head he says father forgive them for they know not what they do y'all don't shout at nothing while bleeding while in agony because of the choices other people made without them asking for forgiveness Jesus offers it and says father forgive them because they made some wrong choices and didn't know what they were doing and that don't shout at Everybody, but nine of y'all and I'll make ten can shout about it because even with your redeemed self, even with your saved self, there are some days and some moments where you make the wrong decision, where you've made the wrong choices, where you said the wrong things, when you've gone the wrong places. But thanks be to God. There's never been a sinner as good as God is a savior. Thanks be to God. 
he's so rich in mercy you can't out choose the extension of God's grace that's why you get new mercies every morning that's why you get grace upon grace that's why even your wrong decisions God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love the Lord is there anybody yes who can say that's my story that's my song I should have been lost I should have been on my way to hell I should have been in a world place than I am but the only reason I'm standing here is because the blood washed me clean and the blood redeemed my bad choices and the blood redeemed my mistakes though your sins yes be as scarlet I have made you white as snow I got to get out of here my soul done got happy I got to let this alone but he is there anybody here who can says I am redeemed let the redeemed yes sir of the Lord Say so, say so, say so, say yeah, yeah, shout yeah, yeah, shout yeah. Did he wash you? Did he change you? Did he justify you? Did he sanctify you? Did he pick you up and turn you around? Did he place your feet on solid ground? Have you tried him? Do you know him? Ain't he all right? 